Right, well, uh, <clears throat> thanks very much to Herb for giving me a chance to, to bang on about my, my hobby horse subject, um, which is problems that have been in science. Um, I'm talking about scientific issues across the world, but particularly about proteomics. Um, proteomics, what's happening in this image here, is you've separated out the proteins in someone's blood, and you're measuring about a 1,000 different proteins in, in that person's blood. And proteins are the things in your body that do jobs. So if you're poorly, your body will make various proteins to fight the disease. Um, if you've got a disease, there'll probably be proteins to do with that disease's mechanisms in you. And what you're trying to do with, with this kind of science is find the proteins that you've got if you've got the disease, but you don't have if you're healthy. So you'll do a, an experiment typically like this. And I'm going to whinge on about how this is not the way to do it, but this is kind of what happens a lot at the moment. So you've got a bunch of people you're going to look at as controls. So they're the healthy people. In this case, we've got three. And those little pots are, are where the blood samples would, would go. So it's just like a representation of the samples. And for each of those people, you'll do one of these protein separations, which involves electricity and stuff, um, and then put that information to the computer. You then do another bunch of people who have the disease you're interested in. I'll talk mainly about prostate cancer because that's what we've been working on, uh, but it could be any, any disease. And then you get the computer to do some clever statistics to try and say, what are the things that are changing significantly between the people who've got the disease and the people that haven't? So you can then try and build a test which looks for the disease proteins. And I'll go on a bit later as there's plenty of good reasons why you want to do that. And to help us get that job done, there's a load of really cool technology that's been developed over the last 30 years or so. Um, so this is stuff that my previous company did. And on the image before, where you saw the, the, the blots on the image, each of the dark bits on those blobs is now represented with the darkness of the blob as a hill on these images to make it a three-dimensional image. And you have to do all sorts of clever stuff, like taking out those spikes, because that's just noise. And what you're really trying to do is what we've done here. And you find a protein which is present in people that have the disease you're trying to diagnose, but it isn't present in people that don't have the disease. And that's what's been going on for about 30 years. And you know, to me, it's all really cool stuff. I got really excited when I started working in this area. Problem is, it hasn't worked awfully well. And um, the reason that I know that is that my previous company, Nonlinear, we were making the tools which help people to do this kind of job. And in my current company, Biosignatures, we're actually doing it ourselves. Um, and I'm, before I go into the, the main bit of the, the story, just want to um, acknowledge the, the key people that have done this because I'm the guy that stands up and talks about about this stuff, but it's not all my ideas. There's a whole bunch of world-class scientists behind this, and particularly the guy in the, the picture there, Dave Bramwell, who's the CTO at uh, Biosignatures, and has had what I totally believe are uh, insights that are going to change the, the face of this industry. So this <laughs> is me in 1998. Um, not the world's greatest fashion sense, and I have no idea why I'm holding up a bit of loo roll there. But, <laughs> um, but this is when I got into proteomics first, 28 years ago. And these are the people that, that got me into it. Uh, Stephen Fay and Peter Mose Larsen, they're, they're two uh, researchers from Denmark. And what you can see that they're holding in their hands is the, the purple thing that I was showing you. So that's... This is what this looks like on the computer when you've scanned it into the computer. And what they're holding is, is how these things look in, in the real. But keen little me was, was working away in, in a factory in, in Newcastle. And these guys came in to check out the kit that we were building to see if it was going to help with their research. And they were so keen that you know, they just got into this proteomics that I'm talking about. And they could see that it had the potential for helping them to diagnose, in their words, almost any disease from a single sample of blood. Now, to, to me, and this is, you know, this is back in 1988, that was pretty mind-blowing stuff. Um, 
just to be able to go into your doctors, you give them a tiny little bit of blood, and they can come back a week later and tell you what's wrong with you, if anything. So I got totally sold on this, and particularly sold by seeing how committed these people were to it. So they were up in Newcastle for a week, and every morning they'd be at the factory gate when it opened at 8 o'clock in the morning, and they'd be thrown out at 9 o'clock at night when everybody wanted to, to lock up. And they worked like nothing I've ever known um, in the time between. And I'd never worked anything like it, and by the time, but by the time I'd recovered, I was totally sold on this proteomics stuff. But here we are 28 years later, and not an awful lot has changed. I've got a lot grayer. Uh, the world has spent probably on the order of $100 billion on this kind of research, but there haven't been a lot of new things coming out of this research, and there jolly well should have been. And the sort of things, when, we talk, when I talk about subprime science, this is the sort of thing I, I mean. So this is a, a headline. I just took it from a, a website. And here's a thing saying, you know, wine causes cancer. Oh, terrible, wine causes cancer. Ah! A few weeks later, same newspaper, <laughs> wine prevents cancer. And so, you know, my mum, who's 78, is there going, these bloody scientists, they, they don't know what they're talking about, do they? They just can't make their minds up. Um, Actually, it's a lot more serious than that. And if you're squeamish, look away now. The next slide's not really awful, but if you're squeamish, you might want to look away. Back in 1988, this is how they would diagnose prostate cancer. It's only relevant for, for blokes, but there are equivalent uh, diseases in the w for women. But they would take 12 cores, they call them. So they get a great big needle and stick it into your prostate. And your prostate's only about the size of a walnut when it's healthy. And you've gone in to see the doctor because there's something wrong with it and you're feeling poorly. And that's what they do to it. Um, I'll move on so the uh, people that squeamish can, <laughs> can look away. But 28 years later, bar a few tweaks like guiding where the needle goes with a, a fancy scanner, that's still what they have to do. And that's wrong. You know, this super-duper science that I was telling you about before should have been able to sol solve this by now. And you should be able to go in and get a blood test Bang, there you go. So now's the tough bit. Now, you've all just had lunch, but I'll, I'm going to try and keep it nice and uh, fun. Um, I'm trying to explain why that happens. So this is our typical little proteomics experiment. So we've got a bunch of people who are healthy, a bunch of people who are unhealthy. We measure all the prote proteins in their blood, and the computer does some hard sums, which kind of tells us what will allow us to tell the two groups apart. Now, as a thought experiment, and I really need you to sort of go with me a bit on this one, try and imagine, if you know the film uh, Journey to the Center of the Earth, it was back in the late 50s or something like that, they traveled down to the center of the Earth, and basically they found there's a whole place which is a bit like the rest of, you know, the top of the Earth, but it had cool things like dinosaurs and things inside it. Now, if you imagine that there was a society down there in the center of the Earth. So they had no access to seeing the sky. And one of their physics people had said, I reckon that there's this thing called the moon that goes whizzing around the Earth. It's just a lump of rock. It goes round and round the Earth. Nice little simple system. And so what she does, she says, well, I'm going to try it. That's my theory. I'm going to try and prove my theory. So I'll send a camera up to the, the surface of the Earth. Don't know how they managed to do it, but they, they find a way to do it. And we'll say, let's take 24 pictures of the sky so we can see this moon and confirm that my theory about the moon there being right was, was correct. So send, they send the camera up to the sky, point a picture up there, and, oh, uh, mm, is, it, is it that thing? Is that that big cloud there? Is that, is that the moon? Um, or is it one of those, the, the stars, possibly? Hmm. Um, or maybe, um, for I know there's quite a few Americans in the audience, if you're from England, you never damn see, see the damn thing at all. Um, or you could get lucky and say, yes, we, we verified your theory, we spotted the moon. But I think you'll probably know, if you just think about it, how often, if you look up the sky, you actually do see the moon. It doesn't happen very often. And when it does happen, you might say, no, 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 it's not a round thing, it's, it's a crescent-shaped thing. We've just, we've seen that. Now, 
that's a really, really, really simple system where you've got, say, one lump of rock going round and round another lump of rock. And in the next picture I'm going to show you, that will be described as two dots with a line between them, okay, a green, green line. This is what biology looks like. Whoa. <laughs> um, these are the interactions between proteins in a fruit fly. So, like I said, that system before would have been one line. This is what's going on in a really basic little fruit fly, and maybe this isn't going to work if we're trying to understand what that does. So, that hopefully gives you an idea of the sort of really difficult problems that the, the biologists are trying to face. So, the big question is, well, that's, that's the problem. What, what do we do about it? Um, how, do we, how do we fix it? Well, you'd think that a really complicated problem like this would need a really, really complicated solution. But actually, you don't. All you need to do is make sure that when people are doing these kind of experiments, they always put them through blind tests. And if you were... Normally, the way science is publicized, it goes through journals. So if you're in a journal, you say, sorry, I'm not going to publish your results until the results that you've got have been tested on something that you never saw when you were figuring out what your theory was, and hopefully by a completely different laboratory. And similarly, if the funders said, we're not going to fund your project unless you actually build this kind of test into the project, then that actually will drive all the behaviors that you need to actually make this stuff work properly. And I've been kind of eating my own dog food, but our company, Biosignatures, um, it came out of the, the insights that Dave had into this problem, and we tried for ages to persuade people to do it the right way as we believed it, and couldn't do it because there are a raft of issues in the system which make it hard for people to do that. Um, so what we decided to do was say, well, if we think we're so clever, we'll do it ourselves. And that's what we've done. So working with the Newcastle upon Tyne's Hospital Trust, we've developed diagnostics for three different conditions, prostate, bladder, and renal cancer, all of which have passed their own blind tests. And the first of which, the prostate test, is actually in a clinical trial completely independently blinded externally blinded clinical trial, which we'll get the results of in a couple of months. Um, if it passes, I'll be feeling very pleased with myself. If it doesn't, I've wasted all your time. I do apologize. <laughs> <laughs> um, but <laughs> we, we thought it was going to, when we started, we thought it was going to take us nine months to do this. It's taken us eight years. And to do it for all of the three products, which is what we thought we were going to do, um, it's going to take us probably ten and there'll be yet more work to do beyond that. Um, but actually, given the complexity of what I was talking about, that kind of makes sense. You know, it's a really, really hard job you're trying to do, so it's going to take a while. And then, to finish off, the reason that I came here uh, was basically to see if I could recruit anybody in, in the audience to try and help. So... The first thing to say is, why might you want to try and help? Well, if you remember idealistic little Will back in 1988, that, that vision of being able to take a blood sample and diagnose a whole load of disease conditions is still possible. You know, it wasn't wrong, it was just a lot harder to achieve than, than Peter and Stephen thought. I think that we can do it. But the way we can do it, I mean, my little company's not going to do it on its own. Yes, we're going to make our, our little bit of impact on there. But I think that what we need to do is get everybody doing this science the right way. And you'd want to be able to do that because if you could diagnose, let's say, ovarian cancer early, they can pretty much cure it. If, on the other hand, you present late, it's a really, really horrible disease. You, we really want to have this capability, and I really believe that our society can deliver it. So what I'd ask people to do would be, if you're sort of Joe Public like I am, and you see those silly articles, you know, wine causes cancer, wine cures cancer, just go, ah, oh, that's just rubbish. 
and try not to take it. You know, maybe even write to the newspaper and say, don't print this garbage, it's just not worth it. If you work in a journal, in a scientific journal, please <laughs> start pushing to have this stuff done. There's a lot of things starting to come out now. The scientific community is starting to become aware of that this is much more of a problem than they thought. Now's the time to start forcing these behaviors through. If you're a funder, again, please don't fund these studies unless you give them the funding to validate what they're doing. Because otherwise, what happens is wrong answers get into the scientific record. And to be honest, they'd be better off staying at home watching telly than doing that, because it just confuses everything. And then, finally, if you're an investor, well, we've got our big clinical trial coming up in a couple of months, and if we pass that, hello, <laughs> we'll be looking to raise about 12 million quid. Um, so we, I would love to talk to any investors that might be in the audience. And with that, and just a little bit ahead of schedule, uh, thank you very much for listening.